Hi, and welcome to the Law Center videocast. I'm your host, Larry DeMarco. Thank you for joining us. Please tune in on every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. when I'll have another uh, guest. But today we have a special one. We have Dean Tong, and he has a combined Master of Science degree in psychology and the law, and has worked as a forensic expert for the past 25 years. He's dual certified. He's a trial consultant and expert in high conflict divorces. He's written uh, and published three books. He's certified as a forensic consultant and child interviewer. He's got a Wikipedia page and he's been awarded the Marquis Who's Who Lifetime Achievement Award in both 2018 and 2019. Dean, thank you for joining us on the Law Center. Larry, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. So why are you passionate about this type of work? Oh, well, that's, that's old news. I got involved in the mid eighties, uh, over 35 years ago with a case involving my own daughter. Um, it, it dragged on as long as your case did for a decade uh, in Florida, went through all courts, uh, had a half a dozen attorneys, half a dozen psychologists. Uh, um, and, and so I was arrested for allegedly molesting my kid and that was dropped after a year, but the family court made him, you know, error to the side of caution on the side of my child. I couldn't get to be a father or parent. I could, I wasn't even good enough for a super, supervised visitation for quite some time. And then when I got supervised visitation, I, I could only see my kids for about seven hours on a Sunday. Uh, it took four years just to get unsupervised visitation. And then I wasn't good enough for overnight visitation ever again until they emancipated, which, were, which of course was the late nineties around the turn of the century. So I, I decided to make this um, a, a personal, uh, uh, if you will, work within the system with, it, with professionals to make it better. Um, I, I went on, of course, to publish books. I uh, went on to get my master's. I uh, <clears throat> uh, learned under Dr. Stephen Ceci, C-E-C-I, who's a, a longtime a prominent uh, psychologist, the father of child development out of Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And uh, his book, Jeopardy in the Courtroom, pretty much became the Bible in this field. And then of course, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus uh, has known me for about 30 years. She recently testified in the Gislaine Maxwell case. Uh, so, so there's a lot of information involved in these cases uh, where we see well-meaning, well-intentioned professionals, but somewhat misguided. Uh, they, they, you know, they're, they're not seeing the other side of the coin which is that you are innocent to proven guilty. So I adopted my website about the time that I started uh, ramping up my professional career, uh, abuse-excuse.com about 25 years ago to, to basically uh, you know, paint a picture for parents and lawyers, uh, lawyers don't get this stuff in law school, uh, to provide them a roadmap for fighting back and, and understanding that you are presumed guilty you do have to try to prove a negative to prove your innocence in a court of law. Uh, and especially in juvenile or family court where the burden of proof is preponderance of evidence or 51%. And of course, so my caseload is, is all over America. I've worked cases from all 50 states uh, in all courts, criminal court, juvenile court, family court, administrative court, when they place your name on the child abuse registry. Uh, so if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're a teacher, if you're a priest, you can't work in that occupation again until that finding is redacted after administrative hearing in front of a judge. Uh, I've worked in lawsuit cases under 42 USC 1983. Uh, I'm, I'm very busy. And, and as my website articulates, I've had over a million hits uh, in that uh, 25 years. So give us a little detail about the type of consulting work that you do. What does it yeah. involve? Yeah, so I, I get hired as a usually as a consulting expert first by the accused parent, uh, mother or father, and, and, and make no mistake, my practice is not gender biased. I get moms who lose custody. I get moms who are false accused of Munchausen by proxy. I get moms who are false accused of failure to thrive and failure to protect. I get moms who are false accused of coaching their kids to falsely accuse the father of incest. I get those all the time. Dean, let me make this really quick point here. You just said you get mothers who are falsely accused of domestic violence by proxy, which is really another word for parental alienation. So you don't have any particular agenda 
about parental alienation or otherwise, you see false allegations on both sides of that. Uh, I, 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 I do, I, I do, Larry. But as a as a nationally certified child forensic interviewer, and as you know, child forensic interview is a function of the government. Okay, so only the government employee takes the kid to the local child advocacy center in in Blair County or Cambria County or or, or Philadelphia County and interviews that kid right on DVD. Yes. I have to, I happen to be certified to be able to help impeach the credibility of that interviewer who's using leading, suggestive, direct, and repeated questions. Uh, but sure, um, parental alienation is emotional, mental, psychological, child abuse. The most egregious form is the false allegation of child sexual assault. That's what I specialize in. Of course, more men than women, more fathers than mothers are false accused of sex abuse than, than moms. But uh, more moms, uh, do you know, let me ask you, in your practice, do you notice uh, more moms getting falsely accused of parental alienation, which what you, the term you used was domestic violence by yeah. proxy, and that's synonymous, right? Right. And so, so with parental alienation, sure, I see targeted parents as fathers, as mothers, um, even grandparents, uh, step parents, uncles and aunts. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, and, 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 and certainly, uh, you know, you want to archive and hold on to your emails, your posted social media, your text messages, your, your, your messages at parenting apps, uh, our family wizard, talking parents, app close. Very important because there's, there's the meat and the potatoes to be able to, to, to be able to show the court that, hey, uh, this guy denigrated me, vilified me in front of my kid. So, you know, with parental alienation, it's a two-pronged test. The judge wants to first know that this is a science. As the gatekeeper of the science, the judge is going to admit that science, either under the Fry rule, as in your state, or in most states, Daubert, uh, to make sure it's peer-reviewed and published, has a known error rate, is scientifically reliable. Then the judge wants to know, okay, I'm going to find this emotional, mental, psychological form of child abuse to be a science, Mr. Tong. How has it negatively affected the kids? So you have to have proof by counseling and medical records, uh, perhaps expert opinion that yes, judge, this you know the the denigration of the targeted parent has caused psychological sequelae, uh, psychosomatic issues with the child, headaches and stomach aches, nausea, vomiting, maybe uh, nightmares and flashbacks, and even PTSD. Uh, and and of course you verify that through the medical records and counseling records. Now a judge is going to raise his eyebrows and say, wait a minute, uh, that's consistent, uh, not in the child's best interest, but uh, just the opposite. I'm going to have to alter the court uh, order uh, if, if it's a post-judgment modification case or, or if it's de novo uh, right out of the gate on, a, on, on an initial temporary maintenance uh, order, I'm going to have to award the uh, targeted parent more relief and equity in law and court because this is the ag aggrieved parent. And the, and the kids being treated uh, uh, terribly here. Now, do you testify from medical records or are you actually, uh, you don't do evaluations of parents? No, 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 I don't, I don't see the children. I don't, I don't see the parents. Uh, I may see my client eventually, obviously in a court of law or a hearing. Uh, obviously I, I go under deposition all the time, right? Uh, but I, I, I mainly critique documents. I hold everybody to evidence-based best practices. Uh, I'm hoping that the uh, system and the professionals conducted what's called a trauma-informed risk assessment and trauma-informed therapy. And that means uh, doing what's called source monitoring and exploring all alternative explanations. Why else could the kid say what she's saying or he's saying? Uh, you have to look at both sides. You can't suffer from what we call confirmation bias and have a preconceived notion. This is, this is what's going on here. So that, you know, th this is what's going on here. It could be the mindset and belief system of the professional. There may be a bias there. But so how you get involved, what usually happens is, as you said, a complaint is made, a, uh, a, a, a government professional then interviews a child and right. makes a finding of whether it's indicated or not indicated. Right. And then you come on being retained privately by a targeted parent. Is that right? Either that or usually the attorney, because as you know, as an expert, I, I hold an attorney work product privilege with counsel. Uh, you hold as a lawyer the attorney client privilege with the client. Uh, so we try to work the three musketeers. Everything is confidential. And, uh, you know, we go from there. So oftentimes the lawyer will contact me directly. All right. And um, you know what? Tell me about those three books that you wrote. 
because I know you give advice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You give so, advice to lawyers and you yeah, testify as an expert, but do you give uh, self-represented litigants any uh, pointers or advice in any of the books? Oh yeah, yeah. So so don't blame me, Daddy. It was my first book. It was actually published exactly 30 years ago. Um, you know, the book takes the reader through the uh, the accused, the accuser, the uh, child protective agency, which of course in your state is called uh, CYS, Children and Youth Services. Uh, it, it takes the reader through the court system, uh, how to navigate the court system. So it's so it's actually a nice handbook for the for the attorney uh, who may not get this in law school or who may get just a smattering of this in law school, but doesn't have a lot of experience in this. Um, you know, and, th and then I go into um, uh, chapters on the false allegations of child abuse, false allegations of domestic violence. Then I get into parental alienation, which is chapter 16, and what's called borderline personality disorder. So, it, it, you know, once you clear your name as the falsely accused targeted parent, you could turn this around and possibly consider with your attorney to file a motion for IME, which is an independent medical or psychiatric examination of the uh, of the alienating parent, um, and and that might turn up you know borderline personality disorder, or it might turn up paranoid delusional personality disorder of the might alienating up, parent you mentioned. Right, right. Yeah. It may may turn may turn up something so shocking the court um, is going to raise its eyebrows at, at, at perhaps diagnoses and prognoses and treatment. Perhaps the 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 alienating parent, the false accusing parent, has to go on psychiatric meds. So, you know, it, it, it's very involved. And, and of course, as an attorney who doesn't, you know, get a lot of academic education and training in science and medicine and counseling records, you have all these paraprofessionals who get involved. Um, you know, the, you get these mental health professionals who are treating a, a little kid, a five-year-old, say, with play therapy. And then uh, you might get a kid who's 10 or 11 with, with trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And the lawyer is scratching his or her head saying, you know, what the heck does this all mean? I, I think I need an expert to, to be able to, uh, you know, help me uh, cipher through all this stuff. So I help on questions for impeachment of opposing fact expert witness. I help the pro se litigant uh, on direct and cross and redirect and recross uh, at hearing, at trial. And, uh, I, and I, help on you're I help on strategy. Yeah, it's all in the book. This book is what, Don't book. Blame Me, Daddy? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that was in 92. So I, I upgraded and, and published two more books. One was in 97, Ashes to Ashes, Families to Dust. And then, um, you know, what I consider uh, a learned treatise, if you will, uh, Elusive Innocence. Elusive Innocence, Survival Guide for the False Accused was published exactly 20 years ago in 2002. It was reviewed by the Florida uh, College of Law, Levin College of Law here at the University of Florida. It was also reviewed in the American Journal, Journal of Family Therapy in 2006. So I have both psychological and legal reviews on that book. That book is used all the time uh, and oftentimes will be admitted into court as a, as a learned treatise or a reference uh, for judges, right? And this is a pract. This also has practical advice for people. Yeah, yeah. I would I would say there's more practical advice than academic advice because I'm not an academic. I'm not tied to a university. I'm not a university professor. I'm not. A, I'm not a PhD. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you wouldn't be testifying on behalf of an abused victim because they have already experts. I mean, I, I, I could, I could, and of course I have, as you know, I, I've, I've represented as an expert uh, mothers uh, who believe their children have been molested. So of course, uh, you know, I, I have uh, looked at child protective interview uh, videos of kids who I believe uh, have made, uh, uh, you know, spontaneous, reliable and trustworthy outcries and disclosures. And as you know, also, most of these cases are child victim hearsay. He said, she said what a child said. We don't have actual medical forensic proof here. Most of these cases are the word of the kid, perhaps being reported by professionals to a court um, from the kid's out-of-court statements. So in other words, if CPS, for whatever reason, misses, misses the boat, doesn't investigate a valid claim, then you can be called in to help that too. Well, sure. And, 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 and yeah, and as you know, also CPS has a plethora of professionals on their side. There aren't too many people that work on the defense side of this coin. So I've, oftentimes, you know, I'm, I'm going to get hired more on the defense side. And, and just so your, your uh, pro se, uh, you know, uh, 
clients uh, may need services. Uh, I get a lot of uh, court orders from judges in states across America where the client is in form of pauperous, indigent, cannot afford counsel, cannot afford experts. And that's usually in juvenile court where they're facing termination of parental rights or criminal court where they're facing a loss of freedom or in my cases, sex offender registration. Okay, so in my cases, you know, uh, it's a Mike Tyson 12 round heavyweight fight. Uh, there's going to be a winner and a loser. And if you don't have information to raise the eyebrows of a prosecutor, you're not even going to get a plea bargain. They're just going to throw the key away on you. And so, right, so, and so I get I get cases. Now, fam family court's a different animal. Family court, unfortunately, you get as much justice as you can afford. Welcome to America. So family court, you know, you're not going to get an order for Dean Tong as an expert from a judge to help in family court. Um, you know, unless you fill out a financial affidavit, unless the court declares you indigent for costs, and then maybe, just maybe, the court might allow you, uh, you know, a couple of grand or something for my fees, for my time, for my work. All right. So you you have those uh, three great books that you uh, wrote, two of which you mentioned are good practical help. So what common advice do you find yourself giving to the falsely accused about yeah, what to so do? what to do to protect themselves or to how to get through. What advice can you give the, the listeners or viewers? Yeah, so nobody, uh, Larry, can prevent a, a, an allegation, an outcry. And, and many of these outcries, you know, they can happen. Um, you know, they're delayed disclosures, so they can be from 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And you're like, you know, you're like Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh against Dr. Christine Blasey Ford on CNN. What the heck, you know? Um, you know, and memory fades with the passage of time. It's not a perfect video. So understand this, everybody is vulnerable to an, to an allegation at any time. And so I encourage all men, especially uh, mothers too, but especially men and fathers, wear a body cam, get a body cam. I don't care if your state says you can't tape uh, legally because it would be a crime. You could be arrested for illegal taping or not. You, you might be able to use it upon your attorney's advice as, a, as impeachment evidence. So, Dean, so let me jump wear here. a body cam. Let me jump in real quick because you're the second person who I've heard suggest this. So, if, if I just broke up with my ex, my child's one, are you saying that I have to wear a body cam every day I'm with my child for the next 17 years? Well, you know, you, you do what you want, Larry, but I mean, uh, the mother can say, you know, the child came home crying and you dropped the kid or you shook the kid. Uh, now it's a case of shaken baby syndrome that's going to go to Dr. Cindy Christian at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, CHOP, and, and now it's Dean Tong time. So uh, you do what you want, but for 30, 35 bucks, it's a safe, uh, it's, it, you know, it's safe accountability. It's great but, transparency. But then don't you have to account for every second that you were with your child? Well, I, I, I always, I, I look, I always encourage all people, whether you hire me or not, to uh, document a timeline, journal or chronology by dates and events. Absolute given. Uh, go to your word processor and document a timeline. You know, where, where, who are you with? Do you have any witnesses? Uh, who was at the restaurant? Who saw you uh, with your kid? You know, do you have any receipts? You got you to gotta do all this because one day it could bite you if, if you don't. Seems like a lot of work. Well, it, it, and, and let me tell you, uh, criminal cases of child sexual assault, you're looking at uh, high five, six figures for a competent defense. And if you don't believe me, just call a criminal defense lawyer in Philadelphia. All right. So um, after it's already happened, though, what typical advice do you dispense when someone well, says... Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big uh, firm uh, proponent of, of psychosexual testing, Larry, psychological testing, because I've been working with a clinical forensic psych now for 15 years in cases. So uh, for me, we're, we're a Batman, Robin, dynamic duo tag team, uh, the doctor and I. And, and, you know, I don't care what the lawyer says. When you hire me, uh, you're going to go for testing. You're going to prove to me and the doctor you're not the monster that the state and the mother, perhaps the mother may not be, maybe the mother's accused, but usually it's the father in a sex abuse case, uh, you know, that you're not, that you're not that monster. So I have to have empirical raw test data that shows, you know, you didn't tell the kid to keep a secret. You don't show sexual interest in little girls. You know, if the kid says he touched my PP on DVD, that's, that's enough to put you in handcuffs. 
And if you don't think a sex crime investigator from the police department is watching that interview, think again. All right, you also, again, the book that you wrote, you're the seminal book, Elusive Innocence, Survival Guide for the Falsely Accused. I understand there's a do's and don'ts section in that book. Can you give us some, uh, a few top threes? Yeah, so, um, you know, do, do hold to your innocence, but, you know, credibility is judged by, the, by, by Rule 704, which is the judge or the jury, whichever, whichever court of law you're in. So hold to your innocence, but understand this is a credibility shootout. Um, you know, and, and so um, uh, do compile a list of witnesses, uh, fact witnesses. If you're going to have experts, obviously expert witnesses, you also have lay witnesses. Lay witnesses uh, have the least, least credibility to a judge or a jury. Uh, again, the judge or the jury determines whether you are more credible than the child. Uh, if this child's old, old enough to testify against you in court, the judge or the jury uh, is the only province uh, that can say whether you molested the kid or not. I can't say that as an expert, okay? I've been asked that in court. I can't go there. That, that's for the judge or jury. Yeah. Um, you know, do, do go for testing. Uh, your lawyer may say, we don't need that. It's unnecessary. Well, okay. Um, you know, and, and, and look, um, you know, uh, I have a section in my book, how to choose your attorney. It's a section of my website, how to choose your attorney. Uh, I don't care if your lawyer is AV rated, Martin Dale Hubble, board certified in, in law, uh, family or criminal law. I don't care if he or she's a super lawyer. Uh, you got to prove to me you're an expert in this type of case, in this type of litigation. This is the horse of a different color. Uh, you can be great at an O.J. Simpson type case with blood and body fluids and hair and fibers and bloody socks. Well, guess what? You don't have any of that in this case. There were no STDs. There's no broken hymen. Uh, there's no bodily fluids. OK, there's no medical evidence. It's the word of the kid against your kid. And, and certainly in a, in a case of parental alienation, you're going to see the same, you know. So how about some don'ts? Yeah, well, don't uh, don't take a polygraph. Uh, in most states, it's not admissible. So you're wasting your time, effort and money. OK, I don't care what your lawyer says. Uh, go ahead and listen to your lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice. I can only give you expert advice. That's what but we're asking for. We appreciate uh, it. It's, it's only admissible in an Ohio and New Mexico over the objection uh, of the prosecutor. OK, not going to come in in a civil case. Um, you know, my, my, the testing my doctor does is a lot different. It, it, there's no polygraph. OK, um, you know, don't uh, uh, you know, don't don't put yourself in a situation, uh, you know, where, where, you know, where, where there's no witnesses. And, and I and I, I say that. Because, you know, there's going to be a time when you're going to be alone with your kid. Obviously, you want to enjoy normal father, daughter, son, natural bonding, attachment relationship. But if you don't have that body cam, if you don't have a witness, you're open season to victimization. So, you know, you got to go through these do's and don'ts of the book. Uh, I offer a free consult. OK, so my, fr my first consultation, which can be up to an hour, is always, always complimentary. Um, oftentimes a lawyer will give you a free consult to start also. Uh, the book's about 12 bucks. The body cam's about 35 bucks. So between the book and the body cam, 50 bucks, I hope you can afford that. Uh, that, you know, that might be your best protection and advice right there. What has been some of your biggest challenges? Oh man, I, there's nothing I haven't seen in my cases. I mean, I, you know, if you're on Facebook, you know, I had a case uh, where I, I was represented in a, a client. His name is John Mast, M-A-S-T. Sure. Um, and from North Dakota. And he hired me uh, in late 2019. And uh, sadly, John was murdered a year ago uh, the other day. Uh, exactly. There's a documentary on that. I stand with John. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was the expert for John, and I was the I was the reason John was vindicated uh, of domestic violence and sexual and physical abuse of his kids. Unfortunately, uh, John did not continue communication with me, and um, you know he went down a different road, and that road led him, um, unfortunately, to seeing his kids uh, allegedly on February fifth of last year. But instead of seeing his kids, he he saw a nine millimeter Glock. Uh, locked and loaded uh, and, and triggered by the maternal grandfather three or four times in his back and it killed him. So, you know, that, that's how contentious these cases can become. That's how, that's how surreal and horrific these cases can become. 
And, and so it's very important that your, your defense team, and, and I stress the word team, you don't get to the Super Bowl with just a quarterback. You need a team. Same thing here. I, I don't encourage you just to hire a lawyer. And, and trust me, I don't need your case. I'm a very, very busy man at all times. These allegations don't take a holiday. So, uh, you know, I, I don't go looking for work. It finds me. I understand. So on a more global scale, what do you think society can do as a whole to make this happen less frequently? Well, when you say global, that's interesting because I, I obtained my master's, uh, double master's in, in 2006, about 15 years ago from the UK. Uh, and this is an issue in the United Kingdom. It's an issue in Canada. It's an issue in Australia, all over the globe, all over the world. Um, you know, with that said, uh, I, I concentrated back in the 90s and try to help legislators repeal laws that I thought were challenging families in this country where in the name of child protection, the family took a back seat. Uh, and I'm talking about a, a, a federal law that you and I talked about before the show started, uh, the Mondale Act, also known as CAPTA, C-A-P-T-A, the Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act of 1974, a well-meaning, well-intentioned, but I think misguided law that's been reauthorized by every presidential administration over the last approximate 50 years. Tell us why, why do you think? Well, that law, uh, yeah, yeah. So that law created toll-free hotlines where you could call anonymously and report child abuse. You could be a vindictive gr grudge bearer with an ax to grind and, and want to get somebody in trouble, or you could be in a custody battle uh, and you just want to call anonymously and say, my, uh, my child's been molested uh, based on the fact that the kid told me so. And so that's going to summon CPS. They're probably going to do an investigation. That's going to wind up with the kid being interviewed and um, you know, it, you know, it all accentuates, um, you know, and, and this is kind of like a festering wound. And, and so until a judge hears this, a judge is always going to err on the side of protection of the child because that's the law. The child's so best believe, interest. If I can jump on that, you believe that anonymous reporting should not be allowed? No. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe it should be allowed. I, I believe everybody should give their demographics and their name and report confidentially. So that if you do wind up to be a witch hunter, if you do wind up to be someone who is orchestrating and spearheading a fishing expedition, you're wasting the government's time and effort and resources, um, as well as uh, lawyers that the uh, accused is going to have to hire and everybody else and the court, uh, you're going to pay for that. You're going to be prosecuted. Dean, do you know if that's ever been proposed that uh, you can still do it confidentia confidentially, but a penalty for false reporting? Yeah, Dr. Richard Gardner, uh, who I'm sure you're familiar with his name, he was an associate of mine. We spoke at conferences together back in the 90s, uh, who's the author of the Parental Nation Syndrome. Uh, he, he actually wrote a petition, uh, a long petition proposal to Congress back in the mid 90s, which was in part going to repeal CAPTA. And they basically just set it aside. And it hasn't been tried since then? No, your knowledge? Not, not, not to my knowledge, right. So you have other laws that you would consider repealing. Uh, let us know. Well, I know well, yeah, so. Violence Against Women's Act. Well, yeah, so that was 20, 20 years later, ironically authored by our current president, Joe Biden, back then under President Clinton, uh, under the National Crime Act. And, you know, that law all requires a statement of fear of threatened bodily harm. And, you know, ex parte uh, in your state called PFA, Protection from Abuse Order, uh, very easy, uh, Larry, very easy to report hearsay in an affidavit that, uh, you know, excuse me, judge, he's nefarious. He served in Iraq. He carries uh, weapons. He's a he's a marksman. He's a, you know, and and, and he's a gunnery sergeant, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm in fear of the safety for myself and my kids. So the judge is going to sign off on that in a New York minute. And, and now you have no contact. And now you're now you're swimming upstream, perhaps climbing Mount Everest, trying to prove a negative. But once you, if you get an ex parte order, that's only for until you get a full hearing. For right. That right. 10 days. And, and good luck, good luck being able to hire competent counsel and experts within about two weeks to a month until that evidentiary hearing happens. So then after that, don't you think a PFA is necessary to keep, to protect women from, uh, in, uh, intimate partner violence. I do, uh, Larry. I also think uh, we need to put a little vice grips on hearsay 
and perhaps have it uh, have a little more teeth under Rule 803, uh, generally speaking, and the exception of the hearsay rule coming from a woman or a child. I just think it's too easy. I think it's too easy to cause a extrication of the family to eviscerate the father from the life of the child and vice versa. I just think it's too easy. I think there needs to be either a um, increased burden of proof to clear and convincing evidence uh, versus preponderance of evidence, uh, or we just need to le legally increase that burden from 51% to uh, clear and convincing 75%. Uh, I just think it's too easy. Uh, I, I think that's what we're dealing with here is, is a, uh, the, the fabric of the family unit in America has taken a hit, a severe hit. And, and I don't know, if, you know who it's gonna take, Donald Trump, to be uh, back in as president again in 2024 to fix that. So what's your issue with ASFA and what is it? Yeah, that's the Adoption and Safe Families Act, uh, Larry, 1997, a few years after the VAWA passed. And that was the Clinton Act. Um, if you, you know, as, as you know, Hillary wrote the book, Hillary's Village. And so this law made it very easy for Child Protective Services to terminate the parental rights of a parent within about one year of the kid being uh, removed from the parent's care into foster care. There's a lot of monetary incentives under ASFA uh, from the Social Security Act, Titles 4D and E, sure. to provide money, especially 4E, I believe, is the one that provides money to foster care. So everybody's making money off of the kid here, family court, juvenile court, child protective services, therapists, guardians ad litem, uh, psychologists, uh, you know, and I, I work cases with Dr. Jerry Cook in your state from Plymouth Township, uh, you know, so and look, I, I'm all for protection of the kid. But uh, what happens to the non abused child who's been treated as if as if that kid has been abused, but really hasn't been abused? Uh, you know, are, are we seeing professional testimony on ACEs, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, the trauma to the child? So very few psychologists will, will come out against their own profession. So what you see is these are well-intended laws designed to protect children that go too far, overreach, and then hurt the innocent. Right. And then, and then you look at, I mean, gosh, Larry, I probably have a half, half a dozen cases backlog due to COVID. I'm sure lawyers have more. And, and, and you look at COVID, I, I've got a guy sitting in jail for over five years, back to 2016 in the case. Uh, from Florida. So, I mean, and, and it's sad because, you know, the alienation builds up in the, in the child's mind, uh, recognition memory sets in with the kid because the kid's not hearing anything good or positive or nurturing about that parent who they haven't seen in five years. They've lost that attachment bond. Now they're being, uh, you know, they, they have total enmeshment to the alienated parent. And now they're being uh, drilled with all this negative stuff about the targeted parent. So of course they're gonna believe all the negative stuff. And, 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 and they're getting reinforced with that same negative stuff by a therapist. Uh, a therapist who's, you know, nobody's vetting this stuff. I'm the guy on the other side who's vetting everybody. And of course, when I come under oath, I'm vetted myself. Sure. Listen, your last, you also mentioned policy manuals should be redacted. And explain how you want CPS um, manuals changed to make this whole profit process better? Well, I mean, you know, every manual is different for every state. But so, for example, I had a case recently in Florida where they interviewed a kid who uh, wasn't even three and they were taking her word for an alleged molest. And the, the very manual says you can't even interview the kid until the kid turns three and a half, because we all know that that's pretty much the age range in which a child can start establishing uh, cognitive memories uh, of salient details of molestation, or that kid can lie, three and a half, not three, not under three, but three and a half. So, so by my gosh, I mean, if you're going to publish a policy man, you at least adhere to it, you know, and then there's a lot I don't agree with, Larry, I'm not going to get into it on, on this short show uh, with the policy manuals, but there's a lot I don't agree with it. And, and so, for example, one issue is child on child sexual abuse. We see a lot of that in foster care. It's hardly even acknowledged in policy manuals for, for CYS. All right. So you really want to see better training for the individuals oh, yeah. Yeah. who are and, conducting the investigations oh, yeah. and you want to see best practices followed. 
Yeah. And, and look, I'm not trying to sell my book, Larry. I'm not trying to sell Dr. Stephen Cece's book, Jeopardy in the Courtroom, which is really the psychological Bible in the field of child suggestibility and memory source contamination. But my gosh, uh, my book and Dr. Cece's book probably should be required reading for every child protection worker in America on these cases. So you have an understanding of what happens to the non-abused child and the targeted parent who's falsely accused. <laughs> So what advice would you have for someone who's living with false ag allegations that that day at day in and day out battle for the person that's weathering the eye of the storm? Well, you know, you go back to my own case, Larry, over 35 years ago, I, I saw a shrink. I, I had to go see a psychologist in 87. I saw one for six months because uh, I was suicidal, um, you know, over 35 years ago. And I was... Uh, arrested and facing 25 years to life in prison on a, on a conviction. Of course, they dropped all charges against me in Florida, but uh, what about the guy who doesn't have those resources, who doesn't have the money to fight back? Uh, you know, and, and so uh, if you do have medical insurance, get in to see a psychologist, get in to see a, a, a therapist who understands parental alienation and false allegations. Now, if you go to psychologytoday.com, you're going to have trouble in finding that perfect expert, because this is the uh, unpopular, politically incorrect side of this of this issue, you know. But um, don't 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 put your case on Facebook. Don't don't scan in documents and don't don't talk about actual players in the case on Facebook. If you don't think the government uh, is watching you, is trolling you on Facebook, think again. So you know, be be very confidential about your case. Um, you know, if you're going to refer to it, change the name of the players, change your name. Okay. Um, and, and go go from the advice of your attorney. And, and, and I pray for you that you have the right lawyer. So, Dean, if someone wants to get in touch with you, how can they reach you? My website, uh, abuse-excuse.com. Okay, abuse-excuse.com. Alan Dershowitz wrote the book, The Abuse Excuse. I have the website. And it's been out there uh, about the same, his book and my website, uh, over 25 years. All right, any other link? Or any other information, Dean, I'm going to put it in the description portion. Yeah, well, as, as you mentioned, I mean, I'm, I'm on Wikipedia. I mean, I mean, if you Google my name, you'll, 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 you'll read recent articles I had published in Family Lawyer Magazine, Divorce Magazine. I just had, they just published three articles that I wrote within the last three or four months um, on parental alienation and said, there's a whole chapter in my book on said, sexual allegations and divorce. Said the acronym, got it. Right. Well, listen, Dean, I, uh, let's leave it there. Uh, I think we're out of time, but I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the Law Center videocast. Larry, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We have been here with Dean Tong, and I am your host, Larry DeMarco. We'll be broadcasting live on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Please come and join us in the chat room. Also, please try out other informational videos on my YouTube channel, especially the playlist for self-help rep for self-represented litigants if you're in the middle of a domestic relations legal battle. Please like, subscribe, click the notification bell so you can get all the new videos and share these great videos with your contact lists and social media friends. Signing off. Tune in next time. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.